Okay, you guys, this is going to be the last video for the Unit 4.1 notes where we're talking about cell communication and homeostasis. Um, in this video, we're going to look at topic four, which is um, when we're finally now going to talk about homeostasis um, and some of these feedback mechanisms that are involved um, in allowing a cell to, to maintain certain conditions that are ideal or um, in special situations they might need to push themselves away from certain conditions in order to accomplish something really important. But let's start with the word homeostasis. So uh, this is a word you should be super familiar with by now having taken lots of science classes over the years. But it's basically this ability of um, an organism or a cell to maintain a certain set of conditions inside of the organism or cell that's different than what's going on external to that living organism. Um, and this is a unifying characteristic of life on this planet is that all forms of life and all types of cells, they have this cool ability where they can um, make sure certain things are happening, um, certain things are staying constant in, um, inside their cells, um, even though things are changing externally. And so uh, a lot of times this involves a kind of a, 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 dyna a dynamic situation where um, there's a, um, externally th variables are changing constantly and inside the cell it's constantly having to to get a sense of what's going on externally and then respond in a way to prevent the cell from getting um, away from these set points and so a lot of times we call it dynamic homeostasis because there's a lot of things taking place inside the cell constantly responding to what's going on externally from the cell so that it can make sure it stays at these these nice stable conditions that it wants um, and so this a lot of times involves uh, these feedback mechanisms where cells are sensing what's going on and there's these certain stimuli um, that are triggering different responses in these cells that cause these cells to do things to, to then respond to those stimuli that come from outside the cell. And so uh, in a lot of situations when we're maintaining homeostasis, it involves something called a negative feedback mechanism. Um, and this is when basically there's gonna be some kind of stimulus that the, the cell or the organism experiences. And by stimulus, I mean something that happens, ex something that's happening that's going to trigger the organism or the cell to then do something. And so we call that a stimulus. And so uh, whenever you have a situation, so in a negative feedback mechanism, what's happening is there's a stimulus that's causing something to happen inside the organism um, or inside the cell. And then the, the organism or cell is going to respond in a way to basically undo what the stimulus was doing. So the stimulus is going to try to push the organism or the cell towards a certain direction um, and then the cells or the organism is going to respond in a way to, to, to resist doing that or to go back the opposite way. Um, this will make a lot more sense when we look at a couple examples. But here's like a basic example of a negative feedback mechanism that doesn't involve biology. Let's just um, talk about a non-biology example first. And so like a thermostat. A thermostat is this device in, in a household, for example, that can sense what temperature the room is at. And we can set these devices, these thermostats, to, to make sure the house or the room stays at a set temperature. And so let's say you set your thermostat at home to be 20 degrees Celsius, um, which is a nice cool room temperature, and you want your room to stay that temperature. And so what this thermostat is doing is it's constantly monitoring what the temperature is. And if the temperature is changing in a certain direction, it's going to initiate a certain response to undo what that that stimulus was was doing the direction that the uh, the direction that was moving away from that set point so for example let's say um, the thermostat starts to sense that the room's getting too cold and so it's supposed to be 20 degrees but it starts sensing that the the temperature is going down maybe to 19 degrees or it's becoming too cold and so then that thermostat triggers your heater to turn on and that heater will then raise the room temperature back up to 20 degrees and so in that situation you have um, you have the stimulus, which is the, the thing that caused this whole thing to happen, which was the temperature was going down, and then your, your thermostat triggered the heater to turn on. That's the response causing the temperature to go back up. We call that negative feedback because the response is trying to undo what the stimulus was doing. It was trying to do the opposite of what the stimulus was doing. Stimulus was causing, the stimulus was the room temperature going down and the response was to make it go back up by turning the heater on. That's negative feedback, um, which also in the opposite situation is basically the same 
the same type of mechanism. So let's say the room is getting too warm, and so it's going above 20 degrees. So the thermostat senses that the temperature is going up in the room to 21 degrees or 22 degrees, and that's going to trigger a certain response to occur. So then the thermostat is going to cause the, the let's say, the heater to turn off um, and maybe even turns the air conditioner on. Um, and so that's gonna, it's gonna do things that cause the room temperature to go back down. And so if your room is too hot, well, let's turn off the heater and let's let it cool back down to the, 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 the set point that we wanted. And in that situation, we, that's also negative feedback because the stimulus this time was the room temperature was going too high, which initiated a response. And that response was to cool the room back down. And the response is trying to undo what the stimulus was doing. That's negative feedback. So anytime the response is trying to undo what the stimulus was trying to do or was causing to happen, that's negative feedback. Anytime they're opposite. So something goes up and you respond to make it go back down, that's negative feedback. Or if something's going down and you respond to make it go back up, that's negative feedback. So there's lots of examples of this in biology. Um, one common example is thermoregulation, the ability of an organism to maintain a, a stable body temperature. Um, and so that involves a couple negative feedback mechanisms. Um, to do that. And so in this picture here, it kind of gives you an illustration of what could happen. So let's say there's a set normal body temperature that you're supposed to have, um, which is like around 96, 97 degrees Fahrenheit or around this temperature, 36 degrees Celsius. Um, and when your body gets to, let's say, for example, your body is getting too warm, your, if your body temperature goes up, let's say that's the stimulus. So your body temperature is increasing. And then what's going to happen um, is your brain is going to sense that your body temperature is getting too high. So maybe you're out in the sun or exercising a lot and your body temperature was going up. Your brain detects that and your brain is going to initiate a couple things to happen in your body, a couple of responses to take place. It causes your sweat glands to become activated to start secreting sweat, which is going to allow evaporative cooling to start taking place, which will cool your body down. And it also causes the blood vessels in your skin to dilate. So the blood vessels near your skin are going to, to dilate. They're going to get bigger which is going to allow more blood flow to take place near the surface of your body, which is going to allow the heat to, to um, go away from your body faster. And that's going to cause those responses are going to cause your body temperature to go back down back to the, the, the ideal set of conditions, the set point. And so that's negative feedback because the stimulus was your body temperature was going up and your body's response was to sweat and dilate your skin blood vessels to, to ultimately cause your body temperature to go back down. And so the response is undoing what the stimulus was doing. That's negative feedback. Or in the opposite situation where your body temperature is cooling down, let's say um, it's cold outside or something and your body's getting too cold and your brain, again, will sense the fact that your body temperature is dropping and your brain will then initiate a couple of responses because of that stimulus. And those responses would include things like shivering. It causes your muscle cells to start uncontrollably contracting um, and you start to shiver, which produces heat. And it also starts to constrict the, um, the blood vessels in your skin. So the blood vessels in your skin constrict, which means they get smaller, which decreases the blood flow near the surface of your body and concentrates your blood internally so it, um, so it doesn't lose heat as fast. And so those responses cause your body temperature to ultimately start going back up, back towards the set point. And again, that's negative feedback because you have a situation where the stimulus, in this case, was your body temperature was going down, which caused your body to respond in a couple ways that caused your body temperature to go back up. And your response is doing the opposite of what the stimulus was doing. That's negative feedback. Um, which in a plant, I also want to give you guys a plant example. A lot of times we don't think about plants, but plants are also living organisms that um, maintain homeostasis in lots of different situations. Um, and so in one situation where we say see negative feedback is um, in a process that takes place in plants called transpiration. Transpiration is this movement of water through plant tissue that ultimately goes to the leaves and then evaporates from the leaves um, to the atmosphere. So there's water that the plant obtains from the soil and that water moves up through capillary action up the roots and the, the, the stems of the plant, the plant tissue and then makes its way towards the leaves. And then the leaves, there on the bottom side of the leaf, there's these tiny microscopic holes in the leaf called stomata, 
we talked about these a little bit in unit three when we talked about photosynthesis, but these holes in the leaves is where gases can exchange in and out of the leaf. So oxygen and CO2 can diffuse in and out of the plant tissue, in and out of the leaf tissue. But this is also where water vapor can evaporate. So water molecules, they can evaporate as water vapor and leave the plant, which allows more water to continually be pulled up. So this movement of water is um, going to allow water to continue flowing through the plant from the soil to the air, basically, um, which um, uh, this might be a problem, let's say, for example, oh, real quick before I get into that, um, the, the stomata, um, those, those tiny holes in the leaves, they're going to be open or closed dependent on these, these guard cells, so these, these specialized cells that form the stomata, the opening into the plant, the, the leaf, um, called guard cells. And those guard cells can either be um, swell up with water, and when they swell up, they allow the stomata to be open, um, or if they lose too much water, they start to close. And so you can have open stomata or closed stomata, um, depending on what these guard cells are doing. And when you look at a leaf, sometimes there'll be a lot of stomata that are open, and sometimes a lot of them will be closed, depending on how fast the plant is doing transpiration with this movement of water. And um, for example, when the water availability is scarce, so let's say there's drought conditions or it hasn't rained in a long time and the there's not a lot of water in the soil, the, that's going to trigger the plant um, to release this hormone called abscisic acid. So there's this hormone that gets released in the plant tissue. Um, and so that's the uh, and that's going to what that causes is it causes the guard cells to basically shrink and close the stomata. And that's going to cause the plant to do less transpiration because now it needs to hold on to water. You can't do a lot of transpiration if there's not a lot of water in the soil. At that point, you're wasting water. Um, and so that's the plant's response. So in this situation, the stimulus was there's not a lot of water available in the, 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 the roots in the soil. Um, the plant realizes that and then triggers a response that causes that releases this hormone and causes the guard cells to close the stomata. So then the stomata start to close and transpiration starts to slow down. Um, and so then the plant starts losing less water. And so that's negative feedback because again, the stimulus was there's not a lot of water um, and we're doing transpiration too fast because there's not enough water in the soil and the plant responds to slow down the amount of transpiration so it can hold on to water. So transpiration is happening too fast because there's not a lot of water and the plant responds to slow down transpiration um, because uh, to hold on and to conserve that water. Negative feedback. Now this is different than, um, so there's something that's opposite of this called positive feedback. Um, and positive feedback is a special situation where we're actually um, going to push the, the cell or the body is going to respond in a way that actually pushes the cell or the body further away from its set point. And this is going to be um, necessary and important in certain situations that come up. And this is going to form a, a positive feedback mechanism. And so in a positive feedback mechanism, what's happening is there's going to be a stimulus that causes something, a response to happen in a cell or an organism. And the response to that stimulus is actually going to amplify that stimulus. So the body or the organism or the cell is going to respond in a way that actually increases or amplifies what the stimulus was doing, which is the opposite of what negative feedback was. Negative feedback, we're trying to undo what the stimulus was doing, and positive feedback, we're actually going to increase what the stimulus was doing. Um, so here's a couple examples of that. Let's start with a, um, we'll start with an animal example. Hold on, my slides froze here. Okay, so in um, like childbirth, for example, is a good example involving <coughs> animals or humans. Um, uh, during childbirth, what happens is the baby's head starts to push against the cervix. So the baby is growing um, and developing inside the uterus. That's this, the uterus. And this is the cervix, which is the opening to the vaginal canal and then out into the world. Um, and then during um, childbirth, when the, um, the mom is in labor, the, the baby's head starts to push against the cervix. And when it pushes against the cervix, it causes this hormone to be released um, into the, the body called oxytocin. So then this hormone called oxytocin gets released into the, <coughs> into the body. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and then that hormone actually causes the brain, so it travels in the blood all the way to the brain. And then the brain, um, it causes the brain to then send signals to the, the walls of the uterus, which is made up of um, some muscle tissue. There's some muscle tissue that surrounds the uterus, and it causes the muscle tissue in the uterus to contract or squeeze more. 
Um, and so then the uterus starts to squeeze more and it starts pushing the baby and then the baby's head starts pushing more against the cervix. And that causes more oxytocin to be produced, which tells the brain to um, send signals to the uterus to contract even more, which pushes the baby's head even more against the cervix. And then you're going to end up with this positive feedback loop where you have more and more and more of the baby pushing against the cervix, which is causing more and more of this response to, to squeeze the uterus to make the baby push even more against the, the, the cervix. Um, that's positive feedback. And that's going to continue to happen until the baby gets finally squeezed out and pushed out of the, um, the mom. And so... Uh, positive feedback because the stimulus in this situation was the baby pushing against the cervix and then the body's response was to make basically make the baby push even more against the cervix which then becomes the stimulus to do that again and again and again so anytime the response is amplifying what the stimulus was um, that's positive feedback and then just one last example with plants um, <clears throat> plants there's positive feedback sometimes um, one example is with ripening of fruit. So when fruit is growing on a, uh, a tree or in a plant, um, that fruit starts to ripen at some point. And when the fruit starts to ripen, it starts to, it releases, ripening fruit starts to release a chemical called ethylene, which is a gas actually. And it releases the gas into the surrounding air. And then that ethylene, that chemical can actually travel to nearby fruit and bind to the cells on that fruit. And it causes those fruit to start ripening faster. Um, <clears throat> and then once they start to ripen, they start releasing ethylene into the air, which then again travels to other fruit and causes them to ripen faster, which causes them to release more ethylene. And so then what happens is once one fruit or a couple of fruit on the plant are starting to ripen, because they're releasing this chemical called ethylene, which causes other fruit to start ripening and releasing ethylene, it basically causes all the fruit on a plant to start ripening around the same time. So once one person starts to ripen, through this positive feedback mechanism where we are ripening and release ethylene, which causes more fruit to ripen and release more ethylene, which causes more fruit to ripen and release ethylene. Around the same time, you're going to have all the fruit um, in those plants and even in the orchard, if there's a group of plants growing, to start ripening around the same time because of this hormone that's being released by the ripening fruit. And so in some situations, positive feedback is necessary because um, we want a situation where we need to, to amplify that initial stimulus to make something important happen, whether it's childbirth or in this case with the fruit ripening. And so just remember negative feedback is whenever the response is opposite of the stimulus. So if the stimulus caused something went up and your response was to make it go down or something went down and your response was to make it go back up, that's negative feedback. And positive feedback is when the response is doing whatever the stimulus was doing. So if the stimulus was causing something to go up or something to do something, the response, if the response is to make it do it even more, and make it go up even more, that would be positive feedback. Or if something was going down, that, that was the stimulus, something was going down, and your response was make it go down even more, then that would be positive feedback as well, whenever you're amplifying the stimulus. Anyway, that's it for topic four, um, and that's it for these notes, the unit 4.1 notes. Thank you guys.